we're going to take a look at the spiritual gifts that are given in the Bible. And uh, no list is complete. No one list has all the gifts. And it's possible that uh, all the lists don't contain all the gifts. But all that are listed are the ones that we can know about. Now, remember, a spiritual gift is a spiritual enablement. It is something that God gives the church to equip it for the ministry that he has. One of the first gifts that is mentioned is the gift of prophet, Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. I understand the prophet here is a foreteller more than a forthteller. A prophet is one who receives revelation from God and who prophesies or testifies of something that will take place. Even the Old Testament prophets were foretellers. Now, they received the revelation from God, and therefore they were a foreteller. They were, in a sense, a preacher. But they were not so much expositors of Scripture, like opening up a Bible passage and then saying, this is what the Lord has to say to you. Let me explain this passage. They were primarily foretellers. And so I understand, as I... Uh, do an extensive study of the idea of prophet, prophecy, prophesying in the Old and the New Testaments, that it is primarily a foreteller, a person who receives revelation from God, and then lets the people know what it is. The ministry of prophet has been very important throughout the history of uh, the kingdom of God because it was God's way of giving revelation. I don't believe that we have prophets today in the sense of the Old Testament or New Testament prophets, foretellers, because I believe, as Peter says, we have everything pertaining to life and godliness in his word. I believe that Revelation has closed the canon, and so we really don't have foretellers anymore like we had in the early church or the Old Testament period. As far as miracles, we have the gift of miracles mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12.10. Miracles were acts of God that went beyond the laws of nature, usually in the area of physical healing, but at times demonstrating power over demons, power over nature, power over the heavens, and power over diseases. And even in the days of Jesus, a demonstration of power over death. We do see that there are times in history when there have been what I would call a burst of miracles, during the period of Moses when he's bringing the people out of the land of Egypt and he is combating the demonism of the magic of Egypt, the demonism and the power of the devil in that wicked culture, God provides miracles to demonstrate uh, his power over all the other so-called gods. In the life of Jesus Christ, we have a demonstration of miracles. This was to validate his mission, his ministry. You remember that Nicodemus says, we know that you're from God because no one can do these miracles unless he is uh, from God. And the miracles of Jesus were giving proof, validation to his messianic mission. Even the Pharisees and Sadducees demanded a sign, a miracle, because that was accepted according to the validation of a prophet. We also see in the early New Testament that Peter and Paul are allowed miracles. They perform miracles to demonstrate that they truly are coming in the name of God, that they truly are sent by uh, the Lord, and at times even, again, to combat the magic of the day. As we pray today for uh, loved ones who are hurting and for situations, I think we need to believe in the God of miracles. But we also need to understand that these kinds of miracles are not normative and that even throughout the history of the kingdom of God, they have come in spurts or in concentrated periods of, periods of time, usually to give validation or proof of the messenger, then the message of the messenger. Along with miracles, there is the gift of healing. This seems to be a specific category of miracles that involves more of physical or a psychological restoration. And uh, an examination of some of the New Testament examples are that usually they were instantaneous. 
they were complete, they were permanent, and uh, that they were unconditional, that they did not necessarily depend upon the faith of the individual. Uh, now, there were times when Jesus responded to the faith of a person, and there were times when Jesus did it in spite of the faith of a person, and then there were other times because of unbelief. He refused to. And so we see that there are uh, definite uh, instances of miracles being complete, permanent, and uh, accomplished by the messenger of God. Another gift is the gift of tongues. This is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. This is particularly a confusing one today for us because tongues is so much uh, uh, an experiential uh, phenomenon that is difficult for people to examine. I'd simply like to say that what we need to do in relationship to the gift of tongues is we need to examine the scriptures and to acknowledge a few things from the scriptures. First of all, we need to acknowledge from Acts chapter 2 that tongues came with the Holy Spirit and that the tongues were languages, known languages unknown to the people. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 2 beginning at verse 3. And there appeared to them as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound occur, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because they were each one, now hear this phrase, they were each one hearing them speak in his own language, the Greek term dialectos, from which we get our dialect. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, We, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans, and how is it that each hear them in our own language, our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they, yes, the people were hearing. They were hearing the apostles, the disciples, speaking in tongues. Those tongues were known languages, unknown to the apostles as they were Galileans, but known to the people because they had come from throughout the world. So for, certainly Acts chapter 2 indicates to us that this gift of tongues was known languages, unknown to the people. Now, when we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the other major passage that speaks of the gift of tongues, is there any indication there that we are also sp speaking about known languages? And I would say that the text indicates that we are speaking of known languages. In the long passage of 1 Corinthians 12 through 1 Corinthians 14, in 1 Corinthians 14, we particularly have the indication of this. Look, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and beginning at verse 10. Paul says, There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may, and it says here, interpret. So we see that Paul references languages in the context that he speaks or references the term tongue. If you go over to verse 21, we have an illustration of this from the Old Testament. It says, And the law that is written by men of strange tongues, and by the lips of strangers I will speak to the people. Even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Well, when we look back to Isaiah 28, 
in which this passage is referencing, we find that the tongue there is a language, a language that was unknown to the people of Jerusalem, but it was known as a world language, as it was their enemy camped around about them. And so I think that from the Bible, any practice of tongues today should certainly be a practice of known languages. It is not gibberish. It is not mumbo-jumbo. It is known languages in the scriptures. And then the Holy Spirit also gives direction that if the biblical languages produced by the Holy Spirit are going to be said, then there is a procedure. One speaks, one interprets. Two speaks, a second interprets. Three speak, a third interprets. And the result is, then there is to be silence. If we have massive amounts of people speaking in tongues all at the same time in a congregation, it seems to me logically that at most three of them could be of the Holy Spirit because why would the Holy Spirit violate his own word or cause people to violate his word when he says one, two, and three? And another important matter for us to understand here is that each time you see the gift of interpretation, it would be better translated the gift of translation. The particular Greek there, word there actually means to translate. You see, you can interpret something without translating it. When you translate, you do interpret. So we have the gift of tongues and what really is the gift of translation. Paul, of course, exhorts us to uh, move on, to seek higher gifts, and that it is better to prophesy in intelligible words than to speak thousands in words that cannot be understood. Unfortunately, today, tongues is causing great confusion. And what we need to do is to put these issues aside and to move ahead with the greater things of the kingdom of God. If you practice tongues today, I hope they're biblical tongues, known languages. I hope you follow what the Bible says, the way they are to be exercised in public. And if you don't, then you pursue the gifts that calling that you think God has for your life. But let us move ahead as brothers and sisters in Christ, seeking to win the law, seeking to spread the gospel. Oh, I would love for biblical tongues to be here today, to put Wycliffe and new tribes and other translators out of business by reaching people with the gospel. But until we see that, let's work together, work together to fulfill the great commission of discipling all nations.